So I took the Solus impeller out for a spin and everything was wonderful. It didn't blow out at all coming out of the hole, which is slang for saying that it didn't cavitate when accelerating quickly from a stop. With the 3.4 impeller, it had a nozzle insert that reduced the uh, nozzle diameter from a stock size of about 109 millimeter diameter down to about 102 millimeter diameter and I removed that for this new Solus impeller and so I ended up at about uh, 112 millimeter di diameter you know give or take a little bit so that means the area was ab about 20 percent bigger at the minimum I should point out that the nozzle isn't the only thing affecting the flow out of the pump you know there's all sorts of resistances in there and the nozzle diameter is part of it but uh, a 10% increase in the nozzle diameter doesn't mean that you're going to have a 10% increase in flow. Uh, I don't know exactly what it means, but it, it does mean that the flow will be up a little bit. Uh, I don't know by how much, though. So with the Solus impeller and the nozzle insert removed, I ended up with exactly the same uh, maximum RPM that I had with the 3.4 impeller and the, the nozzle insert. Uh, so lacking any uh, significant whitewater nearby, I went out for a test drive on a lake and uh, did things like uh, back up really fast or accelerate really fast from a, from a stop. Uh, when I accelerated really fast from a stop, um, then it, it did exceed the, the normal uh, maximum RPM by, you know, a couple hundred RPM, you know, uh, that would be described as a flare, which is actually sort of a limited cavitation. So so it overspins just a little bit and then uh, calms back down to the maximum RPM, which was about 3,900 with a 6.2 DI engine at 4,700 feet elevation. So the elevation is pretty high. And backing up really fast, it did cavitate, but it wasn't the complete blowout that happened with the 3.4 impeller. It was more of a controlled cavitation. You know, as far as how fast is the boat going before and after? Well, you know, it seemed pretty good. You know, maybe it's going faster. I can't tell for sure, you know, if it's a few miles an hour faster. You know, I don't have a GPS speedometer, so I don't know. Um, but, you know, it, it seems pretty good. The main thing that I'm after is a better uh, performance in whitewater. So that'll have to wait. Uh, but a surprise benefit is that the steering is actually much, much easier uh, previously, it was at, at its best, the steering was just sort of borderline acceptable. Uh, you did have to put quite a bit of force on it, uh, but with the uh, nozzle insert removed for the, the Solus impeller, then all of a sudden the steering became a lot easier. Uh, that, that sort of makes sense because the, the nozzle uh, with the insert is the smallest, the farthest from the pivot point. And without the insert, then the nozzle is smallest, uh, much nearer to the pivot point. So the, uh, when, when you're turning one way or another, the torque is much reduced with the uh, Solus impeller and the insert removed. So next I'll have to go out for a test drive in some white water, uh, but there's none of that around here near, you know, within a couple hours drive, uh, so that'll have to wait. So some people have said stuff like, hey, hey dummy, why do you... Uh, explain all this stuff in excruciating detail uh, you know why, why don't you just cut to the chase you know cut out all the bullshit you know and just uh, reduce your videos to like I don't know 10 seconds or whatever they've got in mind uh, well I'm explaining all this stuff in detail because uh, my target audience is people that don't know about this stuff already uh, my target audience is not people who already know all this stuff so uh, I, I do explain in detail so the people who don't know this stuff will be able to understand and then maybe be able to draw their own conclusions. Uh, so so that, that's, what, that's my goal here. So if you don't like it, you really have two choices. One choice is don't watch the videos. The other choice is you can just go punch yourself in the face. Now if you do punch yourself in the face, I'd really like a video of that and I, I will, if you send it to me, I will post it on my channel and, and I'll share the revenue stream with you. Now that I have the pump disassembled for this impeller swap, I thought I'd take a minute to show you a little bit more about the pump. And with mine, with the stock 3.4 impeller, uh, the pump tended to cavitate when accelerating quickly from a low speed. And to prevent that, this insert was inserted into the nozzle, and it, it actually makes the, the nozzle about 
seven millimeters smaller in diameter, so it, it reduces it from about 109 millimeters to about 102. And so what they did was they just bored this out very slightly. You can see there was just a small lip at the back here, and then made this insert. The insert itself is about five millimeters per side, and then it just slides in there and, and reduces the flow just a little bit. And you can see that the insert is really thin on this side and thicker on that side. So it, it works really well, you know, the manufacturing is really nice on that. So it, it did the job. Uh, but with a new Solus impeller, uh, rumor is that you don't need that insert, and so I'm removing it. The result is the diameter of the nozzle will be about uh, maybe three millimeters more than stock. That's because it was bored out just slightly to make room for the, uh, for the insert and to make a nice smooth surface for the uh, insert to fit into. Here's another interesting part of the pump is the cooling water offtake. You can see the hole back there and there I can stick my finger in. So that's where the water comes out of the pump and it heads to your engine to cool the engine off. And here's the hole on the outside here and you can see it runs back along this tube. And this thing fits into that hole and this bolt here that just takes up space and it makes it so only small rocks can get past. A big rock cannot get into the system and plug the whole thing. And on earlier renditions of the Hamilton 212 pump, there was a screen here, but then that screen would tend to get clogged and people had problems with overheating when they were at idle just because there wasn't enough flow. So they got rid of that and, and now there's just this bolt. And apparently it works, you know. Uh, I haven't heard people complaining about it too much. So here's more about how the steering works. The steering shaft comes out of the boat and, and through this hole here and then it fits onto that hole and then you see this little ball comes down into this socket and then when you steer you're basically rotating that ball like that back and forth and, and you're steering. Now an interesting thing is this ball is going back and forth in this socket and certainly there's going to be some friction there and it's going to consequently it's going to make the uh, steering a little bit more difficult. And now uh, here's an interesting thing. I've, I've got this manual print out right here and it says smear the ball of the steering crank with grease and fit into the steering crank bush. Okay. That is the Hamilton manual. So it's saying that I'm supposed to put grease right in there. It's actually saying that. It's saying that. No, never mind that there's no seal here or anything. When you're in reverse, there's just a billion gallons a minute just blasting all over this. You know, so putting grease on, on that is sort of like putting grease on your front bumper when you're driving down the highway going 80 miles an hour in a rainstorm. It's just not going to stay there. And so, you know, pardon my saying so, but that has to be one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. You're going to put grease on that and, and expect it to stay. Now, a guy that I know runs a, a, a three-engine boat, and, and uh, uh, he runs it frequently. So he's very familiar with the greasing needs of the Hamilton pump. And he actually has a permanent grease hose running from his swim deck down to this joint to grease it. And he's a practical guy, you know, if he didn't need to have that, he wouldn't do it. But there he is, he's greasing it. And he says he greases it every day. And one of the reasons that it's really important for him is, well, he's got a three-engine boat, also known as a triple, and so he's got three times the resistance of normal. So there you go. Grease that every day, all the time, because there's, there's no grease cap or anything to keep the grease there. So here's the pump uh, mostly disassembled. Here's the new impeller on here. And I haven't put it on all the way, but I, I thought I'd show you this a special tool that you actually need to pull the impeller off. It's just this puller. Um, I bought this about 40 years ago from Sears, back when Sears sold things that were worth buying. And so here it is still, you know, 40, 40 years later and it still works. So, so the jaws grab onto a little notch that's in the impeller and then you uh, run this bolt against the, uh, the shaft here and then it just pulls the impeller off. So here's another picture of that uh, puller. 
So that's a special tool that you'll need to take the impeller off. But otherwise, you know, you need a few uh, giant sockets and uh, the pump is uh, pretty easy to take apart. And I recommend that anybody who's even sort of mechanically inclined, you know, give it a go, take it apart, see what it's made out of. That way if uh, you're ever disabled with something stuck in the pump that just won't leave, then you'll be able to take it apart and you'll know that you have all the tools that you need to do so. So the fact that I waited 150 hours on this boat to take this pump apart indicates that I was actually sort of negligent because I did not have all the giant sockets that I needed to take it apart. So uh, just go ahead and, you know, give it a shot. It's not that hard. So here's another interesting thing. Here we're looking at the back of the pump and, and here you can see the cutlass bearing and this is just hard rubber. And this guy fits on the shaft and then it fits snugly inside that cutlass bearing. So the cutlass bearing is lubricated with water and so if you run the pump out of water it will heat up that rubber really fast and destroy it. So that's why you're never supposed to run a Hamilton 212 out of water. It's because of that bearing. You know, apparently it works as long as it's submerged in water. Then you're fine. And to go on record as saying not just bad things about the Hamilton 212 pump, I will point out that when something is water lubricated and it's submerged, then you always have lots of lubrication. So you don't need to add grease or oil and you don't have to worry about it running out of grease or oil. So this setup is actually uh, kind of nice from this regard. So here we are again looking at the pump. It's uh, getting pretty much assembled. And here's the uh, steering mechanism again. So you can see what you do is when you move the wheel or the stick, it moves that thing back and forth which makes the nozzle do this. Okay, well that's great, but the manual says that I'm supposed to squirt grease right in here. And then I guess by, by some miracle, that grease is expected to stay even though there's like water splashing back here and when you're in reverse, there's a huge geyser of a million gallons a second passing over this area. You know, and, there's, and apparently Hamilton thinks somehow that grease is going to stay there. You know, maybe it will for a couple minutes. <sighs> so, you know, I was thinking, well, how could I convince that grease to stay? And I was thinking, well, I could put a frog right there. A frog. Frogs are waterproof, you know, so maybe that would convince the grease to just stay where it is. You know, or another option, I could, I could like poke Mr. Hanky the Christmas poo in there. You know, maybe, maybe that would help it stay. Um, you know, I'm not, maybe I, I could like stick him on there somehow with a rubber band. I, I bet he'd stay. Oh, here, here's another idea. I could put one of these in here. You know, maybe, maybe somehow that would convince the grease to stay. You know, po poke it back, or you know, wrap it around there somehow. I don't know. Somehow. Uh, side note, when you're taking your Hamilton 212 pump apart is uh, when you find a torque spec anywhere in this manual, write it down because it's going to take you like a half hour to find it the first time and then it's going to take you a half hour to find it the second time. So just write it down to start out with. Put them all in the back like that. Here's a whole bunch of them. So they have torque specs, recommendations, Loctite recommendations. But kind of what I'm getting at here is see this manual? It's 175 pages. 175 pages for a jet pump. Uh, that can only mean that it's uh, extremely complicated and uh, uh, very wordy. That might be a tactful way of putting it. Another thing to do is just do yourself a favor and get the PDF version of this manual. That way if you know what something is named, you can uh, just pull that up on your computer, do a search and find it instead of flipping through a 200 page or 175 page manual.